Chapter 17, Leases. Uh, this is one of the more important chapters of the chapters that you have left in this course, uh, Chapter 17 and then the chapter on appraising, Chapter 19, are two of the more important ones. Uh, fair housing, uh, Chapter 21, is important as well. Uh, so we'll want to make sure we cover uh, 17 and 19 very well and, of course, uh, the chapter on fair housing. Uh, chapter 17 is about leasing, and lease is a contract between a landlord and a tenant to lease uh, or transfer possession of what are called demised premises. Demised is another word for rented for a period of time with reversionary rights held by the landlord, which means that at some point when that lease expires, the property will go back to the landlord. So from the very beginning under a lease, the tenant is acknowledging that the landlord's rights superior and that eventually rights will come back to them. This, this prohibits a tenant from, if you will, squatting on leased property for a long period of time and then claiming ownership of it. So a uh, landlord's right of reversion is, uh, is paramount in a lease. Uh, leases for more than a year in Illinois must be in writing. So not witting, but writing. So uh, leases for more than a year uh, must be in writing to be enforceable. Uh, therefore, leases for uh, one year or less can actually be oral. So leases for more than a year pursuant to the statute of frauds. Remember, we, we learned this back in sales contracts about the statute of frauds that requires sales contracts to be in writing. The statute of frauds also requires leases for more than a year must be. So the statute of frauds, as we said, verbal leases of one year or less are enforceable. Leases for more than a year must be in writing. More than a year must be in writing too. Uh, there are four leasehold estates, what are considered leasehold estates. These are estates that tenants hold. Uh, so there's the estate for years, there's this thing called a periodic estate, a state for will, and a state at sufferance. Very quickly, I'll go through four of these in just 30 seconds. The big deal with the state for years is if you have a, an agreement with the landlord, and in that agreement, it specifically states the term of the lease that's called an estate for years. No notice is needed to terminate that because from the very beginning, you know when it ends. Peri periodic estates or estates from period to period, if you're leasing property from a landlord over a period uh, and uh, there is no definite expiration date, then you have a, an estate from period to period and somebody has to give notice to terminate. And it doesn't terminate until somebody gives notice. So if you're renting by the day, you give a day's notice, you give a week, a week's notice, you're renting by the month, you give a month's notice. Estate at wills are kind of funky little estates. You don't see them very often. Uh, estates at will are, are sort of special leaseholds, um, and uh, they will expire upon the occurrence of a certain event. So an estate at will might be that you're renting unit A from me, the landlord. Unit A needs some repairs. While I'm repairing unit A, I put you in unit B. When unit A is ready, your uh, estate in unit B, which is called an estate at will, is terminated, and you rejoin your uh, tenancy with A. A state at sufferance is an estate uh, technically an illegal estate that a tenant has. When you're a tenant at sufferance, you're in possession of those leased or demised premises illegally, and that's going to have to create an eviction. And here's our estate for years. As we said, we both know landlord and tenant when they're going to terminate, so nobody has to give notice. Notice is given from the inception of the lease. Periodic estates must give notice, typically in the same period of time that you're paying rent in order to terminate those. A tenancy at will is a temporary estate. A tenancy at sufferance is an illegal estate. And you're going to need to get evicted if, you're in, uh, if you have a tenancy at sufferance. So the estate for years, definite period of time. No notice is, uh, to terminate is required. Uh, the lessee is expected to vacate upon expiration. If he stays on, if he holds over, and he does so without the permission of the landlord, he's a tenant at sufferance, and then we have to go and actually evict him. These periodic tenancies, period to period, indefinite duration, uh, somebody needs to give notice, either landlord or tenant, 
to terminate month to month, usually 30, uh, you know, 30 days, week to week, day to day. Year to year, you don't see year leases typically, but if you have a year to year lease, uh, maybe a commercial year to year lease, uh, then that requires 60 days notice. You wouldn't have to give a year's notice, but that would be 60 days. Tenancy at will, you get to use the property for an indefinite period of time for until something happens that triggers the end of that lease. And I gave you the example before where you might be in possession of uh, Unit B while we repair Unit A. Unit B, you have a tenancy at will. Unit A, you have, a, say, an estate for years. When Unit A is ready, you rejoin it. Tenancy at will terminates. Tenancy at sufferent. Sufferent, you stay on without the consent of the landlord. Not supposed to be there. Requirements of valid lease, um, much like a much like a valid sales contract, some of the same requirements: offer and acceptance, sort of meeting of the minds, some consideration. Uh, the parties have to have the capacity, mental legal capacity, to contract. Uh, it must the lease must contemplate plate and legal objective that's something illegal for the purpose of something illegal that would be make the lease void the land the landlord gives possession of the premises to the tenant but the landlord retains the other rights of ownership other rights being control enjoyment disposition and of course the uh, that allows the landlord to use the premises in all, in all, and for all legal purposes during the term of the lease or until uh, a proper notice is given. Usually the landlord will give a security deposit uh, to cover any damages or non-performance under the lease by the tenant. It goes to the landlord for his protection. Uh, any improvements that the landlord makes should only be made with the written permission of the landlord. Don't, as a tenant, you shouldn't make written, per, written improvements. If you do make, uh, if you do make improvements to the property, you'll have to rehab the property back to its original condition that it was when you took over the lease. Accessibility: landlord has to keep their property accessible for the tenants, and that, this might also include uh, any hazardous. Uh, conditions around the property. Landlord would have to remove hazardous conditions and there might even be gang members that might be loitering around. Security deposits, uh, you should maintain those as a licensee in your special escrow accounts. Um, you need to give, uh, the if you're going to keep any of those security deposits, you need to give a written notice uh, and, a, and document the repairs you're going to make. You have to do that within 30 days of the lease being terminated and give them a full accounting for what you've repaired and give them receipts. Uh, you do have to pay, if you have, uh, if you are managing or if you own more than 25 units in the state of Illinois, you have to give interest to your tenants on security deposits that you hold. And incidentally, while we're talking about that, some cities like the city of Chicago also have uh, security deposit requirements with local laws. So while you need to know this for the state exam, the 25 or more units, uh, do know that uh, there are some local uh, ordinances that uh, also protect tenants and provide for security deposit uh, to them. Uh, and, and, and so check out your local community if you're managing uh, units for uh, tenants. No, I we're basically talking 25 or more units. Have to give the tenant secure uh, interest on the security deposits that they get to hold for them. A trade fixture would be an improvement that a commercial tenant would make for use in his trade or business. So if you leased a vacant area and then you made it a bowling alley, all the lanes and bowling racks and the bar that you put in and all the other stuff that you use in your business would be trade fixtures that you as a commercial tenant could put in. And of course, before the lease expires, you can take all your trade fixtures out with you and take them on to your next venture if you want. So trade fixtures belong to the tenants and can be removed before the lease expires. Accessibility means you, for disabled people, the landlord must make reasonable accommodations for them. What reasonable is is always a little difficult to determine, but a lot of it's common sense. So if you were leasing out some residential units, uh, 
and uh, someone in a wheelchair wanted you to make the doorway a 36-inch door versus a 32-inch door, that's probably a reasonable thing they should do. If uh, someone that had a handicap or was in a wheelchair wanted you to lower all the light fixtures in the unit uh, 8 or 10 inches so they could reach them, that's probably a reasonable accommodation that you would have to make for them. Uh, destruction terminates your lease only if the unit can't be rehabbed or the building can't be rebuilt. So if you're leasing apartment A in my apartment building, if the entire building is destroyed, your lease is terminated. If you're leasing apartment A in my building and only unit A was destroyed, if I can rehab A in a, in a relatively short period of time, you'll have to go somewhere, stay there, and then rejoin the lease when I've got your uh, unit ready for you again. A land lease does not terminate because a land lease, even if the building is destroyed by fire or other calamity, you're leasing the land and that's never destroyed. So under land leases, even destruction of a building will not terminate your lease. An assignment is the right a tenant has to assign their interest to another party. The, 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 the important point about assignments is that in this case here, tenant A, who is the original tenant of the property, assigns the total unexpired term of his lease to another party and then that tenant is released of liability, can go about his business, and doesn't have to worry about any more obligations under the lease. So assignment is where you convey to a new party, in this case, tenant B, the assignee, the total unexpired term of your lease, and therefore you're released of liability. Tenant B now stands in your shoes, and you, you can leave tenant A. But that's different than a sublease. A sublease is where you tend to rejoin and come back to your demised premises original tenant. Uh, in this case here, you might sublease the property from June 1 to September 1 and rejoin and take possession on, July, on September 31. Therefore, you are always responsible, Mr. Tenant, even during the term of the sublease for all the terms and conditions of lease, including payment of rent. So during the sublease, if your sub lessee, tenant B, does not pay the rent like he should, landlord can still hold it against you, tenant A. You're not released of liability under a sublease. Uh, types of leases, uh, we have a gross lease, which is a typical apartment lease. We call it a gross lease because the amount the tenant pays is a gross amount to the landlord. When the landlord gets the gross lease, he has to pay expenses from that. Uh, as opposed to a net lease, a net lease is a lease where the tenant is paying not only an amount to the landlord, but is also paying all other property charges. So therefore, it, we call it a net lease because the amount that the, the landlord puts in his pocket this time is net. All the other expenses have been paid. Typically, net leases are commercial leases. Typically, gross leases are residential leases, re re residential apartment leases. A percentage lease is a lease that a retail tenant would pay to the landlord. It provides for two payments. One, you pay a flat amount each month of base rent, and then you pay percent of gross sales. Uh, for some reason, this screen says net sales. That's incorrect. It's gross sales. Sorry about that. A variable lease is one where uh, it varies month to month. Typical, uh, say, an office lease would be a variable lease, and e each year your lease increases by a certain amount. Uh, sometimes they're variable net leases. A ground lease, of course, is where you lease the ground and you agree to erect a building on it. Oil and gas leases are where you lease your oil rights and gas rights under the surface, and uh, typically that gas company or oil company would pay you a royalty for each barrel or each cubic foot of gas that it takes out of there. A lease purchase, uh, you can find with commercial as well as residential leases, lease purchase where you lease property for a period of time and at the end of the period of time you have the option or the right then to purchase the property outright. Sometimes the landlord will take those monthly payments that you make towards lease and apply, them to the, apply it to the eventual sale price of the property. Uh, a sale leaseback 
is where you sell the property and lease it back. We gave you an example in the earlier chapter. It's really a financing technique. A sale lease back is now the owner sells his property and leases it back. The lease purchase is where you as a tenant lease the property and then buy it. So it's kind of back. It's kind of the opposite of a lease purchase. So the sale lease back is where the seller, the vendor, becomes the grantor at the end of the deal. And uh, so the, I'm sorry, let's strike that again. In a sale lease back, the uh, owner, grantor, becomes a, l a lessee, becomes a tenant. And, and uh, the uh, purchase, the individual that's purchasing the property, the uh, grantor becomes the landlord then and in a sale lease back. Get the t type of lease then that uh, where you're uh, paying a, a monthly amount plus a percentage of gross sales. And then on page uh, 352, we talk about the sale and leaseback arrangement as well as agricultural, agricultural leases. The sale and leaseback arrangement is where the owner, uh, seller, if you will, also called the vendor, becomes a tenant. And the vendee, which is the buyer, becomes a lessor or landlord. Now, why would a company do that? Suppose a company had a very large manufacturing plant and it was worth, let's say, $10 million. And they need $10 million in order to uh, build another plant in another state. What they might do is take the current plant that they have and sell it to an investor. And the investor then would give them their $10 million, become the owner, and our owners would become tenants. So the company is able to extract their $10 million of equity that they have in their plant without having to go and replace it and use that $10 million to buy their new plant and yet be able to stay in the old uh, plant, not as owners now, but as tenants. Sale lease bet. Agricultural leases, of course, are uh, typically these farm leases. Sometimes so we have uh, crops involved. Sometimes we're seeing uh, these agricultural leases are th with the solar wind farms are, are set up much the same way as agricultural leases are. And with the agricultural leases and or solar farm leases, uh, the, the farmer owner of the land would lease out to another company that might actually work the land, plant crops, uh, cultivate the crops and sell them. Uh, the uh, individual doing that, the new tenant doing that, might pay the landowner a, a flat fee per uh, monthly rent or maybe a percentage of what the, the sales are uh, for the uh, crops that he uh, then grows and harvests. This is done very often with uh, these large farm combines, uh, these businesses that um, go out routinely and go to small farmers and if you will sort of gobble them up uh, they'll simply lease their land and uh, you know continue to uh, uh, till the soil uh, and the original farmer gets to continue to live on his uh, premises while he leases out the land that you know perhaps maybe he no longer can manage himself. Uh, leases are terminated when the time period is up or proper notice is given. Uh, leases can be terminated by law, by bankruptcy of either party or if the property is con uh, condemned through eminent domain proceedings. If the property has been completely destroyed and can't be repaired uh, by death of either party. Uh, so if you have an estate for years, even if you as the tenant die, your estate can be held liable for the balance of the lease. And actually with uh, residential leases, that's tempered a little bit uh, that the, the landlord needs to have a, 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 a quickly try to relet the lease. They really can't keep you on the hook for, for more than a couple of months. But technically death doesn't automatically terminate lease even with an apartment lease. Uh, a sale. A sale will not terminate an existing lease. The new owner will be subject to those leases until they actually terminate or, or notice is given. So just if you buy property, recognize that you're going to also buying the rights the tenants have in their current leases. If you default on lease, 
the landlord can give you a five day notice to pay everything or then can uh, immediately uh, proceed to, con to eviction. Um, on any other term, you have a 10-day notice, a 10-day right to cure. Lease is five days to cure. Any other term is 10 days. If they're not cured, the landlord then at his convenience can proceed to eviction. Actual eviction is what landlords do when the tenant defaults. A thing called constructive eviction is where the tenant can actually evict himself if the landlord has uh, violated the term of the lease. So a constructive eviction is a right we give tenants to sort of evict themselves if the landlord has breached the term of the lease. So landlords sometimes can do the same thing. Let's say with an apartment lease, they don't keep adequate heat in the property that you're leasing. Uh, you could give the landlord written notice that to cure that within a reasonable period of time, if he doesn't, you just leave. And if the landlord came back to sue you for the rent, saying that you breached the lease, you would use constructive eviction uh, as your defense. Civil rights law, we want to know that there are federal laws uh, that protect our uh, protect tenants, uh, race, color, religion, sex, nationality, familial status, disability. Those are the federally protected individuals when they're leasing property. There are state uh, classifications, state protected classes. Order of protection, status, military st status, age, marital status, uh, sexual orientation. All these people are protected. So if you are representing a landlord and any of these protected classes show up, you cannot refuse to rent to them based on the fact that they're a member of one of these protected classes. We'll talk more about this in Chapter 21 in Fair Housing. Uh, the big one that also applies to leasing more than sales is familial status. If uh, you're renting property and uh, an individual having a child of 18 or under um, comes to rent the property, you cannot refuse to rent to them because of their familial status, the fact that they're a family with a child uh, who is 18 or under they're protected. You must rent to them. This also includes pregnant women. Disability, you can't refuse to rent to people that have mental or physical disabilities. And people with AIDS are specifically protected from this sort of discrimination in leasing. If you're leasing uh, something with lead-based paint. And by the way, this is called Title X. Don't ask me why, but sometimes they ask this on the state exam. Uh, you must give notice to your tenants. Uh, these are any properties you're leasing that were built prior to 1978. You must tell them that there may be the presence of lead-based paint. You need to uh, ensure that the as an agent, you need to make sure the landlord gives the tenants uh, a lead-based paint disclosure and acknowledgement form, as well as a lead-based paint pamphlet, information pamphlet. Those must go to any tenant leasing property that was built prior to 1978. And you as an uh, agent must see that those tenants give that, that the landlord meets their obligation. Uh, as far as rental finding services, if you work for an apartment finding service, um, their contracts have to meet certain requirements. Your book talks about uh, people that work for rental finding services must be licensed as uh, uh, broker managers, as real estate brokers, or as residential leasing agents if in fact they're only leasing residential property. So those are the Illinois licenses that people must hold if they're working for uh, residential uh, uh, findings, apartment finding services. Uh, referral fees. Uh, as a licensee, you can accept, you can pay referral fees for referrals that you get from your tenants, but they're limited to $1,500 no more than three referral fees in a year. So if you have tenants that refer you their, their buddies and their best friends and they end up leasing, you can pay referral fees to that unlicensed tenant for bird dogging for you, but only uh, $1,500 is a maximum or three referrals in a year. So there's a limit to what you can pay for referral fees for business. Chapter 17, take your tests at the end of the chapters.